Hello and welcome to the debate. I'm your host, Sana Makbul, with you at B2B World. In today's show, we're going to be taking a look at two important stories. The first is in reference to the very important decision that has been announced by the Supreme Court regarding the Supreme Court Acts and Procedures Bill. Um, and this is a decision, of course, which is uh, done in an unprecedented way. And even uh, the decision itself is being called historic and unprecedented by many. However, that is not the only reaction that has been coming in. Uh, there have been multiple reactions uh, that Coming, coming in from different quarters with some of course praising the Chief Justice of Pakistan and the judiciary for this very important and historic step uh, not just um, in terms of the manner that it was conducted including of course a full court bench and an in-camera session uh, but also in terms of uh, the bill actually uh, being decided upon that actually curtails the power of the Chief Justice um, and brings the judiciary under uh, the elected institution of the parliament and this is important especially given the kind of circumstances that existed and historic what was being said about the Supreme Court in recent times. However, there are some who still doubt uh, the uh, the usefulness of uh, this uh, particular uh, bill and whether or not this is a step in the right direction. Um, many are concerned with regards to the uh, issue of the independence of judiciary and whether or not it's going to be compromised uh, this way and whether uh, this uh, particular um, decision opens doors uh, for the misuse of power uh, from not just people sitting in the parliament but perhaps other quarters as well or other uh, elements that will act as spoilers. So this is important especially in terms of understanding then um, the significance that this bill will have both on the, uh, the uh, decisions uh, taken by the judiciary, uh, the role of the parliament, the political dynamics of the country um, and then of course uh, moving forward the way that people are going to be taking in with the expectations that they have from the institutions and the way that they're going to be seeing future decisions. So we're going to be taking a look at all of that in our first section of the show today. Our next one is going to take a look at the economic situation of Pakistan. And this is particularly important given, of course, that we're still in the standby arrangement with the IMF. Um, however, the numbers that have been given by the uh, fiscal monitor outlook um, is, is also very important um, and, of course, concerning as well. It seems that um, Pakistan's budget deficit is being projected at 7.6, the size of its economy, <coughs> our record rupees 8.2 trillion, which is, of course, far higher than uh, the official target. And so we're going to be taking a look at what exactly uh, will that then, uh, then this mean um, for Pakistan moving forward and what it plans uh, for the fiscal year uh, 24 um, and the way that of course now that the adjustments have been made um, whether or not Pakistan will be moving uh, in the right direction and what sort of tough measures uh, will be needed uh, for that to actually happen. Um, we also know that the World Bank had also given a similar figure just last week about 7.7 percent of the GDP. At the same time we also know that this would of course <coughs> increase uh, Pakistan's efforts towards um, gaining more uh, international lenders and not just the IMF which it is still struggling to do so and this means that it would need to borrow uh, rupees 1.3 trillion more than what it had planned earlier um, which means of course that the efforts that would be done previously will now have to be perhaps doubled or tripled as well so we're going to be taking a look at all of that in <coughs> our uh, second segment of the show and try and understand what the economic situation of the country is and what needs to be done uh, to uh, adjust the new figure um, for this and more, of course, in the studios, um, I've been joined by senior analyst Farooq Patafi. And uh, for our first segment, I've also been joined uh, by a political analyst, <coughs> Muhammad Muneeb Kader. Thank you very much, uh, Muneeb, for joining us and being a part of Thank the discussion. Right. And uh, when we talk about what is going on, uh, Mundeep, of course, yesterday's decision is being um, termed as quite unprecedented. Um, yeah. And of course, uh, we've been hearing different reactions coming in. Um, so first of all, I'd like to take your perspective in whether or not you are also welcoming this decision um, um, or do you think that this is something that also raises concerns? So I'm one of those people who's heralding this decision as a very welcome development uh, because I think for the first time in uh, uh, a very, very long while I've seen a particular person who's in a, a position of authority using their position to curb their own powers in a way uh, so as not to let any room be open for abuse of power or exploitation of power even after the current office holder has gone. So, I mean, hats off to Justice Kazi Faizisa that uh, being the sitting chief justice himself, he is so... Uh, secure in his place and in his position that he realizes that he is not at war with parliament and it's not a power grab exercise that that is going on between parliament and the judiciary instead 
what uh, you know the chief justice said uh, uh, during his judgment was that uh, coexistence is also a possible avenue for both mm. institutions you know he talked about institutional balance he talked about uh, the need to have faith in parliament in its law making exercise by which is meant that parliament when it legislates uh, so as to elaborate upon the supreme court's powers under article 199 of the pakistan constitution uh it's meant to enable the supreme court to be able to discharge its duties uh, and its functions more effectively and i think that is uh, extremely important that you've got a chief justice who himself says that he doesn't want to be running a one man show he wants to share power he wants to share power with his fellow judges and he wants to share power with parliament uh in in such a way that each of the three institutions remain within their respective domains but at the same time they respect each other's jurisdiction so i think that it it helps a lot in uh, um, you know clearing uh, or or demarcating the lines between trichotomy of power how power is to be exercised among all the three organs in a respectful manner and in a harmonious manner so uh, it's a very welcome development All right, um, Farooq. We've also discussed, of course, uh, this uh, particular development yesterday as well. Um, uh, but I'd like to take a closer look at what you think in terms of the way that um, uh, different reactions have been coming in, particularly, of course, um, with reference to um, th this reluctance um, uh, towards moving uh, forward with this development based on the fact that there is a potential misuse uh, that can possibly exist, or that there is a certain possibility that the independence of the judiciary has been compromised. Um, we of course understand um that a lot of the uh, the way forward um or the way that the parliament had also viewed this decision previously was to uh, perhaps enhance uh, the efficiency of the courts enhance uh, the, uh, the the fact that the justice needs to be put in place that there is no um a power that is limited to uh, one <coughs> single person however despite all of that it seems that there are people who still have concerns on um the, whether or not the parliament Uh, should also of course be doing this uh, or not or or if it does uh, with reference to the uh, decision by the committee um will there be uh, will this be opening more avenues in the future to perhaps legislate other matters regarding the judiciary right sir thank you very much for the opportunity i think that uh, yesterday also we kept on discussing this but uh, they, you have to actually uh, recognize the, the inherent opportunism is uh, in the the kind of tribalism that is on display here uh, usually all p political parties when they are in power they want everything under the uh, influence of not even the uh, the, the uh, legislature but executive uh, they try to control everything they max max try to maximize power but when they are in opposition we see this grandstanding that continues even now uh for example uh, uh, the the fact is that parliament has done hardly anything except uh, help, helping the judiciary which at that time seemed incapable of actually drawing its own bylaws to uh, help uh, structure the power that was somehow by default concentrated in one man's hand and that was cjp unfortunately uh, at the time of lawyers movement we kept on uh thinking that this is going to transform uh the way judiciary functions but then we saw iftikhar choudhry and the way he uh, uh, you know concentrated power in his hand and he kept on actually uh trying to punish executive and the parliament as well uh, there was a time when 18th amendment was passed and then we saw that they uh, the parliament was forced to come up with a 19th amendment and then there was a law that was introduced in those days regarding dual nationality uh, and the, of the parliamentarians and that was struck down by the supreme court that is not all uh, then you, uh, you talk about 1843 and its misapplication we see a very aggressive uh, iftikhar choudhry and then his successors also who kept on doing it Uh, so the parliament has only provided a structure to this power and when the honorable um, chief justice of pakistan has willingly um, uh, shown readiness <coughs> excuse me uh, to share his power with his senior two senior most uh, judges 
Um, I think nobody should have any problem with that at all. This whole idea that perhaps uh, uh, if parliament uh, is allowed to, you know, make any laws that are going to uh, provide such structure, uh, this will uh, essentially erode the independence of judiciary. With due respect, that, that is neither here nor there. Because when you talk about uh, uh, parliament in the past as well, parliament has tried to do similar kind of things. But if you remember, I told you the other day that there is such a thing as basic structure theory. Uh, so e even if uh, parliament tries to meddle with that, uh, the Supreme Court has the judicial review and it can always overturn such mm. legislations. So there is no harm done. I think that all uh, the Chief Justice of Pakistan has shown is inclusivity. He has actually gone for, uh, you know, uh, the entire bench uh, th that was sitting there. Then he, he was very kind to allow an open hearing as well, which was live streamed. And then, of course, he has actually uh, stuck with the democratic principle. So I think that with all this, uh, anybody who is trying to actually pretend that something bad happened or it wasn't that good, they are just fooling themselves of trying to fool the people. All right. Um, Munisa, previously this um, bill was also criticized um, um, in terms of being too person specific and just um, yep. existing in order to uh, provide the opportunity of appeal to the former Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif um, and that of course is not the case anymore but I want to understand uh, given the the issue of the right of appeal um, it seems there was some uh, distinction uh, between uh, the bench um, as to whether or not this right needs to be given retrospectively as well um, and I also want your perspective on that and whether or not um, given the the uh, significance of certain cases such as that of Mr. Nawaz Sharif uh, or others that are, are going to still impact the political dynamics of today. Um, do you think that perhaps certain cases um, uh, previously also could have been given the right of appeal? So with uh, its verdict yesterday, the Supreme Court, uh, the Supreme Court has proven that uh, people were reading too much into the you know, procedure, uh, into the Supreme Court uh, Practice and Procedures Act by uh, assuming that it was meant to benefit two particular people, namely, you know, Mia Nawaz Sharif and Jahangir Tareen. And now that the Supreme Court has declared that Section 5.2 of the Act, uh, which granted right of appeal retroactively, was ultra vires, uh, all those apprehensions, they have been proven to be baseless. But also, uh, by the same token, we must remember that somehow indirectly, yes, I mean, even uh, Mia Nawaz Sharif or anyone who had been previously disqualified uh, can take advantage, and I'll tell you how. It's because uh, in the interim period, uh, since, uh, you know, the Bandal, the CJP Bandal-led Supreme Court had suspended the operation of the Practice and Procedures Act, they have made uh, a lot of decisions uh, and in complete contravention of the Practice and Procedures Act by forming benches unilaterally. The CJP did that unilaterally. Uh, in complete disregard of the act which has been reinstated just yesterday, uh, which has been sustained. And so uh, those decisions, are, are they valid any longer or not? So, for example, the CJP Bandiyal-led court, when it decided that the Supreme Court reviews uh, and orders of judgment act is void, or when he declared, you know, the NAB amendment laws uh, and that act to be void. Now, what is the legal standing of these decisions? because they were made in complete disregard of an already binding law, namely the Supreme Court uh, Practice and Procedures Act, which has been reinstated. So now that that has been reinstated, what becomes of the cases uh, where the Supreme Court had decided or made its decisions or issued verdicts without uh, going through the procedures laid down by the uh, Supreme Court Act 2023? So the point is that it means that perhaps the Supreme Court review of uh, orders and judgments, I think that act also remains to be valid law. And under that, for instance, you can seek review retrospectively. Other than that, under Article 188 of the Constitution itself, uh, the court has review jurisdiction anyway. 
so they can still review the judgment that they had made with regards to a Nawaz Sharif uh, Sahab's qualification or disqualification for that matter. And then we must also not forget uh, the amendment to the Election Act 2017 uh, to Section 232, which uh, limits uh, disqualification to a maximum of five year period, which has already been exhausted. So it means that, you know, Mia Nawaz Sharif can contest election. Of course, you know, there are a lot of lawyers most of them pro-PTI, might I add, and they say that the Supreme Court has already given a binding decision that disqualification under uh, 621F is for lifetime. But I'm sorry, when you've got an act of parliament on the same matter, uh, and it's more recent in time, it's the act of parliament which reigns supreme over previous judicial decisions. And that is something which has been made very clear by Justice Kazi Faizifa in his landmark judgment yesterday. Right. Um, and and Muneeb Sahib, I want to explore that further in terms of uh, what uh, Mr. Nawaz Sharif is going to be facing upon his return. Of course, a lot of legal uh, measures um, are going to be put in place and the party seems uh, willing to be able to do so. But in terms of what you were just referring to, the matter of uh, the time period of disqualification um, and of course others in terms of what uh, um, has to be processed as per the law, um, what sort of issues do you think he's likely to face and whether or not his participation in the political arena will be will be smooth based on what you just said? I believe that uh, he is returning for a reason. I, uh, I mean, uh, it's just me in my personal capacity saying that I'm not, uh, it's not like I, I've confirmed it with the man himself, with Mian Vashif himself, but I think that it's only that uh, confidence that the coast is clear for him to be able to return to the polit Pakistani political landscape and contest election well in time before election campaigning actually begins. Uh, I think he must have that confidence that uh, he is going to be able to contest the election that he is returning. And, you know, PMLN has been uh, stating and the party leaders have been stating that this is going to be a welcome that, uh, that people will remember for a long time to come. It's going to be a return on 21st October, which is going to be one of its kind. So when, when I believe that according to PMLN leadership itself and the PMLN Supremo Mianavashri, they feel themselves very secure and they think that uh, legal hurdles are not going to act as obstacles in their way. There would be no legal hurdles because that's exactly what uh, Barrister Zafarullah Khan has also said, uh, you know, who's, uh, who's uh, been a uh, former PM special assistant, that uh, in any case, whatever the Supreme Court decides, none of it affects uh, Mia Nawaz Sharif's chances to stand uh, for to contest election because he was never even seeking relief from the epic court uh, with regards to the Parama judgment. And like I said, that uh, following the amendments to the Election Act, uh, five years uh, has been completed uh, since he was declared to be disqualified. And given that it's parliamentary legislation, which ranks superior to previous judicial decisions, uh, I really think that this is one of those moments for Mian Avashari, which uh, he would count as his best politically. All right. Um, Farooq, when we talk about um, uh, yesterday's decision as well, uh, previously, of course, a lot, uh, many times we've seen um, that a lot of the criticism coming in from different political quarters was based on the choices of the benches, yeah. uh, the choices by the Chief Justice of Pakistan. Um, and so uh, the, the target on the judiciary was uh, based on, on, on that aspect. And it seems that at least that that is now removed. But do you think still that in terms of, of uh, different political quarters, um, especially those also that, that have filed petition against uh, this uh, particular bill, um, would still be able to uh, find some way around uh, uh, the, the, this committee as well that is being proposed uh, and, and, and um, still also be able to claim any such issues? Or do you think that um, uh, the, the kind of narrative that, that potentially um, could, be, could have been built previously or had been built also in terms of the fact that um, uh, the judgments um, were not uh, impartial, that uh, is still uh, something uh, uh, that we have uh, at least moved on from? Uh, right, uh, Sana, clever question. Uh, the answer lies in the detailed judgment. We'll have to wait and see what exactly uh, comes out. Uh, but uh, regarding the overall situation, I think that, that two, it, two aspects are very important in uh, original jurisdiction cases, right? The first one is, uh, um, of course, uh, as you have pointed out, who is going to, uh, uh, you know, fix the benches, who is going to decide uh, how many justices sit in uh, a given bench and how they hear it. Uh, the other aspect is whether uh, an issue should be taken up for hearing or not. 
this is a very important aspect yeah. as well because in the past we have seen that uh, you know uh, in Punjab particularly there was a sewer motor that was taken on dengue uh, you know mosquito so similar kind of things also that that seem to be superfluous can be taken up and they can clog the time and arteries of judicial system so it is very important for for the supreme court of pakistan to apply, uh, put in place some measure of triage so this time we have seen that that is there uh, and in com coming days perhaps that will actually reduce the scope of the kind of things that were you know taken in now there is something very interesting that is going on uh, we have seen that during bandial sahab's time uh, you know the uh, the bench was divided we have seen this time also that there are divisions and there are disagreements although they are fluid uh, but uh, uh, let me remind everybody of iftikhar chaudhry's time when all dissenters were removed and because of that everyone was uh, essentially behaving like a carbon copy of iftikhar mm. chaudhry so in that case what bigger, what happens is that three people that you would have included in the in the committee would have ended up uh, giving the same kind of uh, decision that a single person can if that kind of situation happens and remember that there are people all the, the day uh, you know a change of command took place at um, the judiciary at that time many people uh, were out with their pitchforks and their torches right and they wanted to actually get rid of certain people from the bench and that is not prudent because without dissent things cannot move forward unfortunately then what we have seen justice munib actually uh, you know uh, being a confrontationist and all that that would actually uh, further uh, you know bolster those efforts uh, of people who want to get rid of certain people from the bench <coughs> i think that if we have learned anything from iftikhar chaudhry's case uh, the first thing is that don't make a martyr of somebody who might not be actually deserving of that stature the second thing is always try to preserve dissent without dissent you are not going to actually move forward right now uh, as things are the three senior most justices right and the chief justice uh, the senior puny uh, justice and the third one uh, right the third one is a dissenter we know that uh, 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 justice ajaz uh, has a different uh, bent of mind so that actually adds some kind of color uh, to the proceedings of the committee as well so in coming days what what you can see is that uh, supreme court might be able to provide uh, justice uh, without actually f f further politicizing itself um, given that sakim nisar also used certain aspects of the judiciary to go and raid uh, places and then uh, it ended up being about his own but others you know career this kind of things should be avoided i think and that is why you need checks and balances. Right, absolutely. Um, and Muneeb, uh, the um, discussion around what it is going to be, what matters are going to be discussed uh, that Farooq pointed out, also yeah. brings me to certain discussion that was part of the hearings as well previously to this decision, uh, where there, was, um, there, there were a lot of arguments against uh, issues of public interest versus special interest. And I understand that the issues of constitutional matters are being discussed at the moment. But what sort of impact will this then have um, on issues of public interest as well? And if you could also clarify the distinction for us. Um, the distinction between public interest and, and, Special and what? Interest. All right. Uh, first of all, we need to keep in mind the fact that, uh, as Mr. Patafi also referred to, the fact that this uh, judgment had been a tra uh, uh, had been uh, telecast uh, on TV live. So there was transmission as well. There was a lot of transparency. And we also saw the kind of arguments that were advanced by the petitioners and their legal counsel. And they had been insisting that somehow without coming up with any uh, convincing argument to that effect, uh, the, the, the Supreme Court Practice and Procedure Act was impacting or impinging upon their uh, fundamental rights and freedoms. Mm. And that is something that, you know, uh, Chief Justice Kathi Fias Isa questioned the petitioner's legal counsel a lot on, that how exactly does that 
impair or weaken your fundamental rights and freedoms. You haven't come up with a concrete, uh, convincing argument. Uh, so first of all, we need to keep in mind that actually, uh, if we speak of public interest inherent in this particular judgment, I think that it, it really does go in public interest. Uh, and I'm saying that because with this judgment, I think the current Chief Justice has clearly proven that he looked at the legal issue as being bigger than his own personal uh, position. It was bigger than him for the person of Kazi Faizi himself. For him, it wasn't about himself because he knows yeah. that there's a certain time limit for which he's going to seek justice, after which he will have to hand on you know, the chain of command to others. But he wanted to put in place a system where there was judicial comedy, where the chief justice was not running a one-man show, but was actually acting in tandem and in unity with the rest of the bench and the most senior judges. That is why, you know, a three-committee, uh, a three-judge-led committee would decide which matters to take up under Article 1, 2, 3, which directly then again is related to public interest, uh, related to people's fundamental rights. And as well as, you know, uh, the ability of uh, people affected by the Tsuvo Motor Powers of Supreme Court to be able to appeal within 30 days. So a time limit has also been set within which to uh, put forward your appeal. What it does is it increases transparency of how the Apex Court works. What it does is uh, this example in precedent which has been set of live TV transmission, it really makes uh, Supreme Court proceedings transparent and approachable and accessible so that you know the layman also realizes what goes on in the courtroom. Because ultimately, it's the common woman, it's the common man, it's the common Pakistani citizen whose rights are at stake. So I think that in every which way, this case and this decision which came yesterday uh, from this full court bench, it's one of its kind. Right. Um, and Manif, this brings me to another question. When we talk about, um, um, and especially in terms of how the Chief Justice of Pakistan acted, of course, not just in terms of what was decided, um, but also in terms of how it was done. Um, unfortunately, we see that uh, many times when somebody is acting in, way, in ways um, uh, for things bigger than themselves or are not letting yeah. their person um, impacting uh, the, the course of uh, things, it is often misconstrued as, as, as weakness or an opportunity to uh, exploit people. And I want to know whether or not um, this is also something that can be an effect um, of um, how the proceedings have been taken or how if similar proceedings are done in, in the future for um, this to be also um, exploited from within the judiciary, this to be also taken um, in a way where, where uh, the Chief Justice of Pakistan is portrayed as a, in a weak position. Uh, there was also a lot of discussion on whether or not um, um, the live transmission, of course, was a brave move in yeah. terms of uh, whatever proceedings took place, but um, how they can also then, uh, in perhaps future cases, be manipulated in a way which shows um, uh, which which shows the proceedings going against the Chief Justice or shows him in minorities, and what sort of impact will that have um, on his strength and power as the Chief Justice? That's a very interesting set of questions, uh, in fact, you know, and uh, very valid questions, might I add. Uh, first of all, uh, with regards to uh, the ability of these powers, uh, which actually, in one way, I think, has been limited for the Chief Justice, how those could be exploited, uh, which have been validated under the Supreme Court Practice and Procedures Act, I actually think that the potential for exploitation, the potential for abuse of power has only been narrowed down, not widened by this uh, judgment yesterday. Uh, I think that recently, not just in uh, within the judicial ranks, but I also believe that in the political arena, we have seen very fragile egos at play. And people assuming uh, leadership positions with very fragile egos and thinking that it's a sign of weakness to, uh, in their own words, concede. It's a sign of weakness to cooperate. Whereas I think that there is strength in unity. I believe there is strength in sharing your power because, uh, you know, sharing your power doesn't reduce it. It only increases it. It only gives you uh, and lends you greater legitimacy. And exactly what I just said, that for Justice Kazi Faizi saw this decision yesterday that he uh, issued was greater than his own person. He knows that he is setting a precedent for future judges. And, uh, you know, we've been particularly after the 2007 lawyers movement and when, you know, Mr. Saad Jodhi came in, we had a very populist judiciary which liked playing to the gallery, which in itself then uh, taints 
judicial impartiality and judicial independence. It's not a good trend for a chief justice to develop a cult of personality. That is for populist politics, to do, not for judges. And so here we've got a chief justice who himself says that he does not mind his powers being limited within acceptable bounds of constitution. He does not mind sharing his powers with his fellow judges, his most senior fellow judges. He does not mind sharing powers with parliament because a very narrow reading of Article 191 of the Constitution had been advanced by, uh, you know, dissenting judges, particularly by Justice Muneeb Akhtar, when they said that, oh, you know, it's exclusionary in effect and uh, subject to the law and constitution under Article 191 only means that only Supreme Court has the power to make Supreme Court rules, not the Parliament. No, I'm sorry. Nowhere in Article 191 is the language exclusionary, i.e. excluding the Parliament's ability to legislate. When it says it's subject to the law, of course acts of parliament are laws. There are no doubts about it. So when you've got, you know, a full court, a full bench saying that the Practice and Procedures Act is absolutely fine, when you've got the Chief Justice saying that it is within the parliament's legitimate domain to legislate so as to add to the constitution. It wasn't a constitutional amendment. What the parliament did through this act was that it elaborated upon what uh, the Supreme Court's powers and what its review powers, what its appeal powers really meant and how they were to be exercised. So it wasn't contradicting the Constitution. It was elaborating upon what the Constitution stands for. So in every which way, the uh, ability or the potential for abuse has only been narrowed and has only been reduced, not increased. And that, for one, is something that I, as a member of the legal fraternity, consider a very welcome development. All right. Thank you very much, um, uh, Mr. Maneem Kadir, for joining us and being a part Thank of the discussion me. as well. Thank you. Um, Farooq, would you like to add something before we get to Right. I have wanted to just chime in, uh, contrib uh, contribute answer to uh, your wonderful question. I don't understand why is it that uh, we are so uh, squeamish about possibility of more media access, right? Uh, in, in Pakistan, uh, I don't know why everybody keeps on fear sweating about the idea that maybe there is some secret inside the court that will be outed if the media is, uh, if the proceeding is aired live on television. I think we are in a very different age. Uh, we are WikiLeaks and others have made uh, uh, secret, uh, secrets of state uh, virtually impossible. So if somebody actually t uh, picks something out of one, one particular statement or uh, hearing, uh, there's always a context because the whole thing has been aired already and it is available on YouTube uh, and various other websites. So people can go and always check or, uh, you know, fact checkers can step in. So I don't know why is it uh, there this much worry that these things will actually portray uh, uh, the CJ or for that matter the, the entire bench in a negative light. Mm. I think, uh, in my humble view, uh, uh, this is the burden of command, this is the bur burden of leadership, that there will be naysayers, that there will be people who will try to cast aspersions on you. Uh, and honestly, then the Supreme Court has tri trifecta of powers, which are very huge. Well, one, judicial review, the second, 184.3, and then contempt of court as well. By the way, just to remind everybody, while I've been an open critic of Justice Bandial, one has to admire one aspect of his, and that no matter what we said on air, he never summoned us uh, in a contempt of co court case. Mm. All right. Um, we're now going to be moving on to our next segment, which takes a look at the economic situation of the country, particularly, of course, with uh, the um, fiscal monitor outlook um, that has just been released by the IMF that talks about uh, the uh, the projected uh, budget deficit of Pakistan, which is now being said is at, say, 7.6 percent, different from the previous 6.5 target <coughs> that was set earlier. For this, we have been joined uh, by a senior economist, Dr. Hakan Najib. Thank you very much, Dr. Hakan, for being a part of the discussion. And Welcome to the debate. Um, we've, of course, talked at length about uh, the um, standby arrangement with the IMF um, and, and the way that we're going to be moving forward as, as time goes by. Um, I want to know then uh, where we stand today, of course, uh, the, the kind of figures that are being presented also 
adds much more in terms of what Pakistan will need to borrow, about 1.3 trillion more. Um, and we're already um, uh, looking for a lot of international lenders beyond the IMF as well. How do you see this particular number impacting Pakistan's current progression since the standby arrangement has been um, uh, has been met with the IMF um, and whether or not we can then actually readjust in a way that uh, this new figure um, can also be accommodated within this fiscal year. Dr. Hakan, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. So good to be with you guys again. So let me try and explain what has happened in the yeah. fiscal monitor data uh, that you're referring to. Um, Pakistan had agreed with the IMF that the fiscal deficit, so the, 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 the expenditure and the tax, if you subtract uh, the overall expenditure from the taxes and the non-taxes collected uh, after giving to the provinces, would be somewhere at 6.5% of GDP. That would be the deficit Pakistan would have. Um, what has happened subsequently is um, that Pakistan's interest payments have gone up uh, because we've had to raise the monetary policy um, and we've tightened the monetary policy. You know, the current uh, policy rate is about 22%. The calculations for the debt payment, the interest payment, um, of 7,303 billion um, were probably done at a much lower rate. So considering the higher rate, IMF now thinks that instead of 6.5% of GDP as the fiscal deficit, Pakistan is likely to have a fiscal deficit of 7.6%, which is the extra 12 to 1,300 billion rupees that Pakistan would have as the fiscal deficit. And this extra money um, is something which is, of course, you know, debt funded. So Pakistan's debt would go up consequently with that kind of an amount. Um, yeah. um, and that is uh, what we are saying. So now Pakistan's overall fiscal deficit in terms of numbers would be, you know, over 8 trillion rupees. Um, and, you know, we'd have to do more domestic borrowing as foreign borrowing is not that forthcoming. But in the overall analysis, the growth has been kept at 2.5% um, by the IMF and the uh, world um, uh, outlook that they've given. Uh, the good part is that the inflationary figures have been revised slightly downward. So they were expecting inflation to be higher than 23.6% um, earlier, I think, by about 2%. Now it's down to 23.6%. So that's kind of a slightly better news. Um, uh, seeing the crops... Um, cotton and rice um, are doing better, um, and let's hope that the IMS review goes, um, um, uh, you know, smoothly. Um, um, of the 30th September targets that we had agreed with them, um, things would uh, be uh, more on the normal side. Um, now it depends. We haven't had the uh, exact numbers come in. The data comes in by the end of October of the fiscal operation. Um, so what is our uh, primary deficit? Um, in the first quarter, what is our fiscal numbers otherwise, what are our monetary numbers otherwise. Um, let's, let's hope that we stay within the ambit of the quantitative performance criteria that were agreed with the fund, the continuous performance criteria, and the indicative targets that have been agreed with the fund. So that's the overall outlook um, that is um, going on with the IMS. Um, it, it's, um, as I've always felt, very important for Pakistan to stay with the IMF program, try and complete. This is not a program. This is a standby arrangement. Try and complete ninth month standby arrangement so that the inflows that are needed in terms of the dollars are fully met. Um, I think that's largely the, the, the picture, Sana. Right, but uh, Dr. Hakan, what I want to also know is that given the increase in debt now with the kind of numbers that we're looking at, um, about 1.3 trillion, um, how exactly then will Pakistan be able to adjust according to that and what sort of measures are needed to do that? So that's, uh, you know, the right question to ask that what is it that we can do? Uh, Pakistan's um, uh, fiscal side, of course, one is the expenditure and the other is the revenue. So on the um, expenditure side, I think a lot can be done. Um, in the short run, I think Pakistan also needs to look at its developmental budget um, and the developmental outlay. And some savings could probably 
um, be seen there of the projects which have a longer gestation which we haven't even started yet and smaller 10 15 20 percent allocations have been made they can probably be curtailed where there is expenditure on projects which are probably you know have uh, near completion and this year or next year we can still go ahead and spend the money then the other key areas of pakistan's expenditure reform um, include of course our state funded pensions the subjects that need to be devolved to the provinces monies that we are giving to the state owned organizations the general subsidy regime needs to be tackled for example i think very clearly we are going to spend 464 billion on the income support program it's a flagship program but once you have devolved these subjects education health um, to the provinces then you have to start thinking differently right part of this program should be funded by the provinces so maybe there is a saving of 232 billion to be had um, once we start talking to the provinces and move these kinds of expenditures in the short run of course cutting down on whatever um, current and development expenditures that we can do um, it is going to be essential so that this 1300 billion um, that they are talking about stays at least at 1300 billion um, because uh, you know my fear is that if the interest rates stay higher for longer uh, uh, this um, uh, interest expense could be even higher i think the imf still being conservative and hoping that inflation would come down and our monetary right. tightening would ease um, but i fear that inflation is still sticky um, you know we still um, 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 have um, 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 a fair bit to go uh, though the good part is that the imported inflation component is going to start easing from this month as um, the rupee has strengthened about 9% um, in the interbank and has strengthened about um, 17% in the open market so the petroleum products should see a a uh, good revision and that should have an impact in the um, coming month um, um and and end october figures on the inflationary trend as well um so expenditure cutting and then of course making sure that our tax target of 9400 billion is not only fully met um but if we can go ahead and you know there has been talk of uh, you know retail tax um, um and there has been talk of uh, um some kind of uh, tax on um, a capital gains on property so if we can start moving in that direction that would be um, also something um, which uh, should give more confidence um, uh, to the markets to the uh, multilaterals um, and lastly the foreign funding um, would become very important um, yeah. you know the foreign funding is through project loans program loans the geneva 910 billion dollar pledges the commercial inflows the bilateral inflows so all 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 of these um, are our um, support um that 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 we need to ensure um right so you know a lot of hard work for the government right uh, doctor sir i'm glad that you actually brought up uh, monetary uh, tightening and policy rate a policy rate at 22% seems to be excessive uh, but then uh, you also talked about growth rate that uh, imf has already predicted uh, their forecast is but merely a forecast the question right now is do you see any possibility of growth in the presence of such a humongous policy rate on the other side then we also keep on hearing from world bank that uh, it is the government uh, that is uh, you know benefiting from 75% of banking finance uh, only 25% is available from the, for the private sector why would a private sector be investing in anything when they can actually uh, uh, you know uh, send money to the banks and make healthy profit out of it so all important points right i mean one imf growth rate is 2 and a half percent the government thinks that we may hit more than 3 and uh, 3% somewhere in the range of 3 yeah. 3 and a half percent um the state bank feels we are going to be at 2% um world bank thinks we are going to be at 1.7% and adb at 1.9% so you have uh, starting from 1.7% of world bank to 3 and a half percent of the government so the truth is probably somewhere in between uh, the growth primarily is coming from the agriculture side um, the cotton crop last year 5 million bales this year 12 million bales so that's a big jump that also pushes the agriculture sector 
um, 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 along with uh, the rice production, which is coming quite good. So these are two major crops that are, um, um, you know, going to create some kind of growth in the agri sector. Um, secondly, um, uh, you know, the second round effects of the cotton, of course, are going to be seen um, in reduction on the import bill, but also some, you know, uh, push in the uh, textile industry. Um, if we can sort out some of the issues, um, um, we are hopeful that, you know, the textile would do better um, and the, uh, the, the kind of performance would be better for some growth from there. Uh, my personal uh, thinking is that growth would be around um, somewhere 2 to 2.5% because last year's growth, the top stuff, is very, very important was either 0% or was a negative, um, uh, uh, you know, 0 0.5 to 0.3%. So you're coming from a low base, um, uh, so we, we may be able to do something better on the um, um, agriculture growth and a bit maybe on the, um, um, you know, um, uh, what you call the uh, retail and the trade sectors um, and the service sector overall, so you may see a bit of growth there. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that this growth would be um, um, uh, there because, you know, our population growth is 2.6%, so we are not going to be, um, be able to even grow to that extent. Um, I'm, I, I was uncomfortable reading that the South Asian growth, um, um, there's an, another report that's just come out today by the World Bank, um, is expected to be around 5.9% this year. Uh, India is growing well, um, the other economies are doing all right. Um, um, so uh, Pakistan's recovery is very, very slow-paced, um, considering, of course, that we have uh, an interim setup, a new political government has to come in, so more certainty is there. And, you know, the investment that we are trying to form will take time. Um, maybe we can do some deals on um, the investment side and some flows would come in and that would give an impetus. Today, another thing that markets have told us is that uh, the stock market um, was at a six-year high. Um, so um, the markets are pricing in um, some kind of recovery this year. Um, the, today, I think it was uh, back in 2017 June um, when the um, Pakistan Stock Exchange was um, at a level of 49,527. Today it has written, risen to 48,771. Um, the sectors that have led this growth is, of course, the banking sector, because you rightly pointed out um, their profits are high because they're making money from the government, uh, because the monetary uh, policy tightening, the rate that they're getting is high. Fertilizer sector has done well because there is a recovery in the agriculture. And the power sector um, uh, scripts are doing well because people think that there is some kind of effort on the uh, recovery side. So the circular debt may be eased a little bit in coming days. I think that's right. the overall picture of the economy. Right. Thank you very much, Dr. Hakanaji, for joining us Thank and you. sharing your insight with us. Um, that's all that we have time for. But we're hoping, of course, that Pakistan will be able to move ahead in the right direction and be able to, of course, uh, complete the standby arrangement and then, of course, move towards progressive policies for the country. Thank you, Farooq, for always being part of the debate. That's all that we have from the show. See you tomorrow.